All right. So today I'm going to read from my forthcoming book, The Edge of the Continent, Volume 3, The Desert, which is the final act in my trilogy of books of poetry about California. The first one is about the forest where I live up here in Humboldt County. The second one is about Los Angeles, the city where I spent almost six years living and creating my career. And then this third book is about Joshua Tree, the desert uh, where I wrote so many things and did so much deep, deep spiritual work and healing. It's a very sacred, special place to me. So this is the first time I've shared any of these poems. Uh, the book comes out in late June or July, uh, and I'll try to, you know, do more readings and maybe there'll be events again where I can actually come and read in person to you. But for now, this will have to do. And I tried to go through the book and just picked some poems that I thought were applicable to this moment, which is what I've been doing throughout this National Poetry Month series, just picking poems of mine that I've written that seem appropriate for either, you know, moments of crisis or like perhaps touching on the deep, deep thoughts that we're all having in this time that feels like a great shift for humanity or could be. Um, and then the desert is the place where I experience the greatness of solitude um, like chosen isolation, chosen solitude. And I thought that reading poems from that book right now, not just because I'm excited for the book to come out and I want you to pre-order it, <laughs> but also because we're all stuck alone. A lot of us are in solitude right now. So it seemed like an appropriate uh, reading to offer. So I went through and picked some of my favorites and printed them out because I don't have the book in my hands yet can't wait to hold it. It's the best moment. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to read through these. And, you know, I what I like to remind people whenever I give a reading is just listen and take away whatever you want from it. You know, if there's a line that reminds you of something, you know, just dwell on that and enjoy that. Or if there's an image that brings up a memory or brings up a feeling, and that's all you understand in the poem. That's enough. That's what the poem is for, just for you, for whatever you take from it. So I'm going to read these. And then at the end, if you have any questions, I'll lean in and read your tiny <laughs> questions on the screen and try my best to answer those for you. Uh, thanks for listening. Any sign of a human being. Any sign of a human being in the desert is unwanted. I'm not here to witness us. The discarded garden glove dropped in the sand startles me every time I walk by. I snarl at the tire tracks that tore up the rock field. Old wool blanket, burnt out sedan, rusted box springs, all scars on an otherwise subtle place. The bombs to the Northeast, the hiss of cars on a nearby road, and the rattle of chain link, all a distraction from the voice of wind. But the silver set of Toyota keys balanced on the sand hill brings me joy. I like the unknown story there. The footprints that I share the trail with could instill a sense of fear. I'm not alone here. And yet I wonder who else enjoys this rhythmic trek toward the setting sun. Did they restack the mound of black rock so that I'd notice? I changed the composition a bit to communicate with them in return. I hope we never actually see each other. That would ruin it. Quiet. Sometimes the bee or the fly sounds like a human voice. I pause to hear how close the man is. Is he angry or laughing? Near enough that I can make out his words? No, it's just the humming in the Palo Verde, busy wings catching sun in their iridescent lace. The wind makes voices in the plants. The low-lying bush sings especially loud. The fence groans and makes a knocking. The rafters squeak and reply like an antelope rat. 
This cold pear is perfectly ripe. Some parts of its flesh are as brown as mine. Today, I've seen at least four varieties of ants. There's no one to show them to, and I'm fine with that. If anyone else were here, they'd be speaking, and I wouldn't hear the language, and I would hear this other quiet language. Draw who you want. Tonight I discover that if I draw a creature in the sand, it will appear. I kneel and trace a dragonfly and one flies by. I try the jackrabbit, usually more elusive, and a slender one walks out onto the path ahead of me. It comes closer and circles. I scribble the grasshopper and one the color of white granite lands on my bare knee. I sit before my altar of quartz and hold my breath in belief. Who else do I want to see? I decide not to draw the snake today, not the coyote, but the tortoise, so rare, a test, I suppose. I forget to draw an eye and think that means I'll see a dead one. Walking home, I spot the smallest flare below a creosote, a strange flower in the sand. I bend over and pluck it up only to gasp in awe at the mummified foot of a tortoise, whole, waiting for me as I asked it to be. Well, that was a day of pure magic. <laughs> How are we to know the limit? How are we to know the limit when something as astonishing as the fig wasp exists or when we ride Mustangs? We cannot know where to end or where to give up. We thought this planet was flat. We thought everything beyond the eye's capability was abyss. See how it continues onward? Understand how we're truly as limitless as the universe? We're just spinning, eyes open, mouths open, awestruck, and guessing. That feels like an important thing to remember right now. I like to emphasize this concept of everyone sort of being able to delve into the poetry of this moment because there's time and space. Um, and, and what comes out of being alone is sometimes challenging, but often it, it is so illuminating and kind of expresses what true needs are there. Look at Tio. Oh He's always creeping. <laughs> so this, this poem made me think of that, like what guidelines we create for ourselves, what rituals come up when we're alone and how we maybe wouldn't hear those things otherwise. The rule of rocks. I walk through the desert and rub the smooth backs of every semi-flat stone, a ritual of stroking. I'm not allowed to pocket any unless they're fully on the surface, no matter how beautiful, no matter the shade of green or shape of heart, I leave them fixed in sand if they aren't completely poised atop the ground. Rare, wind-polished crystal, strange, flame-like granite, small chips of shining quartz. I kneel and pet, kneel and pet, and hope for a few that wiggle with the obvious signal of a gift. Touching them alone is enough. We can't touch each other right now, but you can pet a rock. <laughs> Visitors. Here's the rule. Don't come visit but I've never been good at saying no. When you all arrive from the city, I become the apprentice. I learn from you because no better way to be friends. I'm not alone when I need to be, so I embrace the gift of wisdom that each of you brings. If I show my teeth, just remember, I came all the way out here to be the bear. I must love you with ferocity because I answered the phone. I said yes. 
come into my sacred den. Whenever I lived out in the desert, I would hardly ever let anyone come visit me. And I had some friends be very, <laughs> they were not happy about that. Um, and then others understood. So I thought a lot about that solitude and in this moment, you know, just being trapped and at home and how much I love to be alone. So it's maybe not as hard for me as it is for others, but I also really am tapping into the empathy of what that is and depends on where you are because I'm blessed enough to be in this place where I can step outside and look at my great big beautiful friends that are giant trees in the valley and listen to the hawks and all of that. So um, the next one is called, We Can't Stay. I usually wear silk and walk alone to kneel before the datura. But tonight, I'll wait until the sun is about to set and take you to the place where I've been weeping. The bush with the white horn blooms and velvet green leaves. Maybe try calling this plant the same thing I call it, gentle. We can relax side by side in the still warm sand, rose colored and so soft. We imagine the rush of water that fills the wash in spring, and it scares you. I'll spook you again sometime, but water in a dry place isn't a good enough reason. We should celebrate it, but we need to cry before we dance. I trace a circle around us, and my tears come right away. Yours do too. There's so much sky, the land seems small. We watch the first star, and I remind you, this place doesn't want us to stay. But like anything else, if we linger just a little longer, the shadow will reveal the source of light. Perhaps that's what's happening now. Oh, this one. The Great Command. The great command holds my attention at various points throughout the day and night. Keep on living, keep on living, keep on living. I hear a voice ask me, what abilities can I manage? Of what am I able? I respond with whatever I can muster. I follow up my ideas with infinite thanks. What else is there in the face of such mystery other than continuous celebration? I'm just happy to be anything at all. I say yes without fault, for nothing could be too wrong. Everything is as it should be. How could it not be? That's something I remind myself of every single day. Earthquakes. I sit at my desk writing a letter to a friend about the longevity of our love, and the house starts moving from side to side. The cat stares directly in my eyes, and I put my hand on the wall. The earth can turn everything into a wave if it wants to. Days later, I sit on the hill in the yard writing in my journal. I like to situate myself in the warm sand, no blanket or chair. My skin is touching the ground as it again begins to tremble. It's as if the planet is trying to shake me from its fur, as if I'm on a boat in a sudden storm, land becomes a ripple, not a solid thing to carry me onward. I get many calls. Am I safe? Am I afraid? I'm thrilled. I'd like to see the desert break open, swallow me in a crack alongside black beetles and ant lions. The cat stared at me the second time. From all the way across the yard, he kept his gaze on mine. His alarm was instinctual, but calm. Maybe that animal sense of mine has left. Maybe I'm just as tired as the earth. It's falling asleep. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I'll read a few more. 
No creature ever feels safe. Every creature is always on guard, connected to the will to live. I'm held by my love of Earth. I can feel our orbit. I sense the actual spinning motion. I'm embraced by an ancient grandmother spirit and by the light of desert rose cradling my head. Even so, I find myself afraid. I'm lying in the wash, pretending to be the snake, belly and brow on the warm sand. What is it that I fear? Not death, not the snake. I'm afraid of men. I'm afraid a man will find me. I'm a woman alone in the desert. I turn over. This seems wrong. I have my knife and I can see for miles in every direction. I love being alone in the desert. A flock of fighter jets soar over me. The bombs start dropping out at the military base and the ground shakes. I start crying because I see where the fear comes from and instead of it being irrational, it's reasonable and loud. Two hawks appear to do a swirling dance. The moon is full. I see Datura close by. When it's dark, I realize I need to release something old from the left side of my neck. I'm no longer just a small animal. I see myself as a warrior throughout all of time. Various types of armor, once with a baby tucked under one arm, once with my hair in a knot high atop my head, solitary and determined, carrying a sword. This is also when I first see the dead rat in my neck. Is it really dead? I can't tell, but I know it means something and it's time for a ritual. I make three small tombs to bury a bullet shell, a piece of tar roofing and a nail. The grandmother spirit speaks through a spindly chaparral. No creature ever feels safe. The tortoise in its burrow, cottontail in its den, mockingbird asleep in the yucca, always with one eye open, death imminent, and safety is a ruse that lasts but a moment. We all nearly get washed away in the yearly storms. Some of us perish, some of us root deep enough to hold on. The darkness wants you to forget how many times you've survived it all, that you're an animal with sharp teeth too. I'll do what I can. I'll find a way to wake up the rat. That one's kind of a doozy. <laughs> That the rat gets revisited in the book. <laughs> but that concept of no animal ever feeling safe is actually quite a comfort to me, especially in a moment like this where none of us feel safe. Just a reminder that the concept of safety is a very human-oriented concept, and we are not safe. We are always, what, there's some quote, stampeding towards death. I think that's from a jo Joanna Newsom song. I, I like that though, that feeling of just being like, yeah, we're always headed towards it. Who knows how it will happen any day, any time. A serious and luscious gift. I'd never have a rooster. I'd only have a dog if I owned land. I do like the concept of marriage. I'm more of a male vibration. Where does the wound reside in my body? My hands show a few scars from chopping firewood. I like to take the lead. I enjoy the company of cats. I like to be taken care of by someone I trust. I'm still trying to find out the best way to eat. I'd like to own a very nice dictionary. I'd like to spend time in a garden every day. I should read more. I can imagine being a mother someday. My friends are holy and dynamic. Gentleness and rest are important. The work is never ending. Alone. I walk the desert at dusk, harvesting chaparral and welcoming the new moon. I sing a line from your song over and over. I carry back as much kindling as I can hold. The kettle is hot. 
I fill the wood stove. The cat smells sweet like sun and dust. I can hear the horses moving in their stalls. I light the daily candle. I say my thanks. I settle in under the wool blankets and appreciate memories of skin, of touching, and I murmur a coup while turning off the light, grateful to be alone. I like the thought right now of that power of remembering touch and like letting yourself feel it without having to fully yearn for it. Um, just that sense of thinking of something and maybe embodying it without actually even needing to long for it, being grateful to be alone, grateful to have the space. Um, I've been practicing acceptance a lot during all of this and trying to understand like what that means and looks like. And it's really powerful to have a negative feeling about anything that's happening and just be like, actually, I'm gonna replace that with acceptance. What else is there to do? The center of nothing. It's a warm night and I decide to sleep outside after checking the bed for scorpions. The stars are a sheet of white and darkness appears only as thin threads between the glow. I take some deep breaths as coyotes sing a few miles away. I ask the sky, what will we become after so much waste and greed? The answer reverberates in my skull. You will all soon be weightless, without ground, like ears of corn floating in space. Without well-loved land, you won't eat. You'll be outlines of air. A black hole speaks in each human eye. You are the center of nothing, little pencil lines in an equation of chance. Three shooting stars end the discussion, and I smile before dreaming. I've cried so much already. I really love that poem. <laughs> um, lots of crying. Lots of acceptance. Lots of crying. <laughs> this one's called Remembering. And for everyone who has joined, because I haven't been paying attention, um, these are all poems from my book that's coming out in June about my time living in Joshua Tree. So they're all about the desert. Remembering. When I'm here, did you hear that hawk? <laughs> I'm so happy the hawks are here. The crows have been crazy, so it's nice to have some hawks take over. Anyways, remembering. When I'm here, I don't forget. I remember to clean the knife with every use, else it tarnish. I look down at the same spot on the trail each time I pass by to see the dead white lizard, a feast for the largest ants. There's no marker, no tall tree to signal my eyes. I just remember. I like to lean in and hear their jaws working the dried body back into the ground. It's that quiet. I remember to wipe the excess sesame oil onto my shoulder while I'm cooking. It smells so good that I lick it. I remember to close the gate so the dogs can't get the cat. I consider the fact that I can talk aloud to my dead best friend whenever I want to no one will hear, and this means I can also yell at him. I do. I yell, and I cry, and I beg. Everything can happen slowly here, because there's no need to rush, nowhere to go. And I recall the time, only so I don't miss the sunset, so I don't miss my nap, to witness just how long a day can be. I'm certain that we are all engaging in that practice right now, witnessing just how long a day could be. Um, okay, this is the last poem that I will read from this batch today. And if you want to pre-order my book, I would really appreciate that. I know everyone's kind of strapped for cash right now, so no expectations. But 
sometimes people ask me if pre-orders matter or if they should just buy the book from me. And I'm always like, pre-orders matter. <laughs> just, you can buy the book whenever you want though. <laughs> um, this one's called California Doesn't Belong to Me. We're not supposed to be here. Who sees a barren world will plant and cultivate, will complicate the landscape. We did that. And now the coyote circles the fence and waits for the house cat. Rattlesnakes get caught in the plastic tree shades. The birds sip from the leaking hose. And I know I'm not allowed to feed the desert tortoise my strawberries, but the whole system is broken anyhow. Everything is stolen from a lineage of people who knew how to live with this land, who nurtured the collaboration with Western Earth, who tended rivers and exchanged effort with animals, who filled baskets with just enough and never too much. California doesn't belong to me. Its human bond was cracked long before my atoms came together in this form, long before the frontier became a seed of longing in greedy hearts. Now, everything I love is just a ghost of what could have been. Now, everything I wish to protect is a reminder of a story once shared in song, the greatness of the coast cherished by those who, wipe, who rightfully wed the edge. Thanks for listening. I'm trying to find my mouse on here. There it is. Okay.